Einen wunderschönen guten Tag. Ähm, den nächsten Speaker muss ich wahrscheinlich nicht vorstellen. Den habt ihr wahrscheinlich gestern Abend schon gesehen auf der Gala. Das ist der McFly. Äh, er wird heute mit uns sprechen über Parameter Security. Ich habe mir gerade sagen lassen, da geht es vor allem um Netzwerktechnik in Firmennetzen und so weiter und so fort. Äh, wenn McFly das gerade nicht macht oder Galas für 20 Jahre im MCD hält, dann kümmert er sich um Security im Hafen von Rotterdam. Ich nehme an IT-Security. Ja. Alles andere wäre auch irgendwie ein bisschen ja. weird. Das meiste andere ist dann auch Safety und damit habe ich nichts zu tun und die haben auch völlig andere Blockademöglichkeiten. <lacht> anyway, viel Spaß bei diesem Vortrag. So, hello. Uh, you can all move a bit more to the front. So, uh, most of the talks on this event are in German. Who of you does not have a problem with English? Because I see at least one listener who does not speak English, uh, did not speak German. Um, and I think this is the only event that he has on the whole event that is actually in English. <laughs> so, is anyone not good with English? Is anyone... Not, you're not good with German. Okay, that makes it easier. <laughs> okay, so um, this talks about parameter security. Um, I gave a talk on the GPN a while ago. Who of you did see this talk? Who of you did not see this talk? Okay, good. Good, I didn't delete all of my slides. Um, so to start up with, I'm uh, McFly. Uh, my real name is Emma Lecher. I work in my uh, life as security advisor. What do I do there? I'm responsible for basically everything around software security, uh, yeah, security uh, within the software development. I am also uh, most of the times uh, doing these jobs that would be called the architect, and possibly I will become that soon when we will have a position for this. Most of you here possibly will know me from this. Uh, because the next, uh, besides the Miller and my Chaos days, I also started the Milliways. So I'm, um, in the old time there was the rule, you become a hacker when somebody you value as a hacker calls you a hacker. So uh, to this, FX made me a hacker. Um, I'm a security professional. I'm an NPC in a computer game. Um, I'm at least sometimes I have active in uh, a hackerspace and I'm doing a lot with woodworking. I am um, old, as you possibly see here. So uh, I was actually one of those, the dude in my school that was the first person with a computer in a school. Um, I think from that you can roughly now estimate how old I am. Um, I'm a member of the KS Computer Club and go to the Congress since 1996. I spoke at my first conference in, 2000, in 1999, and from then on, I basically took a professional path in the direction of uh, security. Uh, you see, the slides have also been used for a more businessy-ish event. Um, the easiest way to reach me likely is via Mastodon for all of you, and this is outdated because I'm on the Milliway server. Ha. Ah. No, anyway, so um, I've been uh, um, I've been consultant before, and for this I have been building security systems uh, for a long time that are mostly built on a on a parameter. Uh, we got better with this. We got better at technology, and well, it didn't help. Uh, I still do the, know the date. It's the 27th of uh, June in 2017. The company I worked for at that moment as consultant was called TNT. And that got pwned by NotPetya. And we had 45,000 Windows desktops and over 9,000 servers. And all of them was gone in eight minutes. We were also a network, like a parcel company. So who of you is in networking? You possibly know the feeling how it comes when there is, you have basically something like pipes where there is packages coming out the whole time. And when it gets to too much, that becomes a DDoS. Uh, in the parcel uh, industry, something else can happen. Those network pipes are trucks. When the whole system comes down to a halt, the common sorting center can roughly handle half of the packages it goes through per day. 
and then it's full and all of our computer were gone and we couldn't uh, uh, um, we couldn't process parcels, parcels anymore, which was a very interesting feeling. That is a very, very physical DDoS that then happens with real physical packages which you can't drop. Or you can, but they only go down a meter fifty, and the next one you drop on top of that, then you know that high. So it doesn't help you really a lot. Uh, I learned a lot in this. Uh, it was an experience that I, uh, to some degree, hope that everybody of you use in security will at once have, or also never have. Once have, because this is the biggest learning you will have in your professional life, an event like this. Not have, because it's actually not having a good time. I slept in the company for, I think, eight days. Because we were basically working every time we were not sleeping and because driving home took too long, so we just directly slept in the company, basically on couches to get the company up and working again. Uh, we needed roughly a week to make this company a parcel company again. A lot of the stuff is lost forever because there are two backup systems. One of the backup systems was based on Windows. So learning, don't base your backup system on Windows when the rest of your company is Windows and connect it all to a parameter network. So what's a parameter? Wikipedia has a nice definition that you can all lead, uh, read over there. Um, the more simplifier version that I usually use, it's kind of it's a line that defines the inside and the outside. Um, if you're in computer security and networking, I am very sure you have seen the castle. Um, in some slide, in some variation of one or another that defines that there is an outside, there is gates where you control if somebody actually is supposed to be in and not. Uh, yeah. That is the parameter. So where did it come from? In the old times, uh, uh, the parameter was easy. So we had mainframes, it was a big room, um, and the parameter was basically the gate to the door. That wasn't completely correct, because at that time you already could log in yourself via terminals, via modems or so, but the intelligence and everything that did computing was still in this room. How does the mainframe look? Like this. Most of you will know this picture, though. <laughs> that was a mainframe. Um, there was a moment where uh, computers were connected. Uh, the first internet was basically built on mainframes. Um, after that, we basically moved over to client-server networks. Uh, first came IPX that I'm jumping over, then came TCP IP based one. Um, so you know Novel Netware, your Windows 2000, your at that time Linux number. Who has seen those times and had to deal with that? Who of you had to deal with mainframes? Well, that, I'm really surprised. That's quite a lot. Good. After a while, we got the client-server applications. So you, you had applications that were used by more one than one person. Um, so you usually had a server somewhere and a client to connect them. That client did run on some people's uh, work computers and they could things or do things with that. One of the examples of that would likely be the early versions of SAP, if you're in a company. Um, and then the internet happened. This is uh, the logo from the first browser. It's called Mozilla. Uh, uh, it's, uh, it was called NCSA Mosaic. Uh, Mo Mozilla came kind of out of that. Uh, there's another explanation of how the internet looks. That's this one. Um, I guess most of you at least guess. The other one of you have to look something up. Yeah, with uh, that, the internet came firewalls. So that was the thing that defined the inside and the outside. You again see that the common example is a wall. And this is your company internal network. This is the outside, your parameters, everything that happens on this side. There are the gates of the network to the outside that define that can go in, what can go in, and what can go out. Usually, you do this in this category on based on IP addresses or basically network like IP addresses, ports, uh, state flags, and all of that stuff. But on IP stuff, so you don't really look into the application in there. We used this is uh, uh, the newer form that came after the client-server network. 
this is uh, uh, in work basically internal network applications that work with web technology. That is then the later versions of SAP. Uh, today, you very often would likely see this in your company as HR. It's basically internet technology, but only used within this uh, protected areas. At some point, to we uh, said putting all those computers in the basement isn't cool, so uh, we actually hire data centers. Um, and that is the moment where the physical boundaries of a company began to uh, get detached from the virtual boundaries, right? So your virtual company extends to the data center that from a network standpoint is usually part of your company network. So if you draw your parameter, uh, it gets now complicated. You have to draw your building, you also have to draw your first data center. From a network standpoint, just to get a feeling, how many people of you have to do with networks? I guess three, four, five, a lot of them, cool. Um, VLANs is a topic for you, you know what that is, it's basically virtual networks that I have over my uh, network um, and uh, usually I have something like uh, a router that has a layer 3 firewall functionality in the center that connects to all of them, but still makes every decision basically based on network parameters. So then we got VPNs. We had salespeople that wanted to access computers from the outside. They needed to be connected to the network because the times where you were dragging around big books with prizes wasn't cool anymore. So we, we got CVPNs. Uh, a bit later in time, we would become very happy about this. But this de facto leads to the point um, that now the, every place where somebody that works in your computer goes to becomes part of your computer parameter network. That might be his whole apartment, that might be your customer network, that might be a, a, a Mesa, a trade fair, uh, that might be your coffee shop. Mm -hmm. The thing was coffee, right? I'm from the Netherlands. So, <laughs> firewalls got more involved, uh, so at that point we partially got away from the point that we um, made decisions purely only based on uh, the parameters of connection. Um, we had firewalls that were working more working on an uh, application layer. We had IDS IPS systems that basically looked on the traffic on the outside and tried to estimate if that is malicious on more factors than just the IP addresses and the ports. Uh, we got SSL interception uh, and we got user aware firewalls. Um, you should say user estimating firewalls though. The level, there is a lot of, I, I'm not going into vendors, but judging which user is the owner of the connection is usually hard, unless you live on that computer too. Uh, if you're in a large company network, you will possibly see that your updates on your computers are running as local admin, but the uh, username that is assigned to you in your user aware firewall is usually the owner of the laptop, which sometimes more helpful, but it's not the user. We got software as a service. And uh, because we're all used to this point of having those uh, uh, things on the internet, we usually use the functionality that we're restricting the access to the services to the IP ranges where my company is in. So de facto, to reach those services, you have to be on the network, usually via VPN. So we ended up in the situation that to watch YouTube or Office 365, you still had to connect to, you still connected over your VPN. Um, that was the YouTube is, uh, um, and all the other traffic is uh, very quickly, for the people who have to administrate that, becoming a traffic. Users had VPN connections, the company had a relatively small internet connections compared to their DSL home network connections. The people started using those computers to do whatever they want, and that contains 1080p video streams from YouTube, that very quickly means that your internet connection of your company is not happy. Trust me. So, then uh, we get platform as a service. Service in the data center moved into the cloud. So cloud is a term that has various applications. I'm talking here from stuff that is more platform as a service. So you're basically still building to some degree your servers in the cloud. Um, partially using the technology of, uh, uh, um, of just virtual machines. And yes, there is companies that sell you virtual machines and say this is cloud technology. 
Um, but some got a more to the point of using cloud connectivity where you had compute nodes and storage nodes and all of that stuff which you could abuse to build virtual machines. And that's a really stupid idea. They became part of the company network. So we now extended our network to uh, a more international company that some th maybe or maybe not will tell you where your system is and maybe or maybe not you have an exclusive network within your uh, cloud solutions. But actually, nobody really nice, really, really works. Uh, nobody really knows. With infrastructure as a service, where also other stuff went in there. So um, to compare to platform as a service, that's a bit different to differentiate. Infrastructure as a service, uh, examples for that is uh, your ICT stuff, uh, printer and printer services. So if you buy a modern printing station as a company, you will find out it will not work um, anymore alone on the company network. You're printing from your computer via your client to something something that might be running for you exclusive you or your printer vendor is running for you, something of a cloud solution where the printers then also connect to and then you're going back into your company network and then you um, actually the paper comes out. So. That means a lot of other stuff now suddenly moves into your parameter. Um, and then COVID happened, and we all worked from home. And that means we all connected to the VPN. Um, very quickly, people were annoyed when they were working from home. That happens specifically in the point when you actually have a wife and children. Um, because they have the tendency to not precisely respect this thing is called working hours. Um, so a lot of people started to rent out office spaces in the city to have an office there. Uh, it would be irony if it would even be the office space from your company that rents those out that you then rent in again, but they're not liable anymore. But basically the problem that becomes out of that, your employees are now spread over the city or even further away. They're sitting in uh, several uh, um, workspaces where you can actually work from something. They're sitting in coffee shops, in both of them this time, um, and in all of the different networks. They might be working from their consultancy company. They might be working from, you don't know. That all becomes a parameter. And the moment where you connect all of those via VPN to the company network. And at this point, I'm usually trying to ask people to draw the parameter of your company. Given all this, can you still do this? Because, good, I work at the Port of Rotterdam, which is a big, bigger, so it's 65 kilometer workplace. Uh, we couldn't, like, we totally couldn't. Like, we had two network engineers, but that we said, hey, your task is now to draw a parameter. And four weeks we came back and we still found things that were part of the parameter that we didn't really um, oversee. Defining a parameter, we're getting to the problems of the parameter see, uh, now. Defining a parameter sounds very easy, but as I'm trying to lay out, in practice it can become a bit complicated. Um, and there's another part, because you have an inside and an outside, and you assume the inside is safe, you tend to uh, say everything that's on the internet of the network is safe, therefore I have lower security requirements, or put this into a, another different uh, point, of we, point of view. The pen, test, uh, the pen test says we have lots of vulnerabilities. But it's not that bad. It's behind the firewall, right? So that is precisely your lower security level within your company in your parameter. Um, you consider things to be not so be easily attacked uh, because it is sitting on the parameter, it is in your secure company area. Um, and in the end, that was the idea of it. I mean, that's the idea of a castle. You, you have an outside where all of those guys hang around that are potentially not safe. And you have an inside with guards, with long spares and swords that uh, kind of make the difference. But yeah, we'll get to that. The problem of parameter security means that you have a gigantic network that spans on lots of different places, and there's a route between them. 
So from a network standpoint, you can't necessarily connect. Uh, it's like you will likely have VLANs and firewallings in your house in between. Um, but every computer has at least a route to, well, maybe not all, but at least most of the computers in your company network. Right, so you have an IP space. Usually in companies, you have ten dot something. Then you make lots of subnets in this company or in the university. Uh, Lehrstuhl or so gets assigned one IP space. They then get uh, what whatever slash twenty or so. The same as in a company, different areas get different network, uh, different uh, IP spaces. There is a principle a route between them. There might be firewall settings uh, hindering you. This is a requirement for what's called lateral movement. That means that your the malware you potentially have on your computer jumps over to your colleague. Uh, in practice, you then say, "Ah, we just block everything that is not useful, well-defined traffic that we know that is good." Oh, we're coming at the same point with parameter security. Because I bet when you can't draw a parameter of your company network, you cannot draw a network diagram of your company defining what is all good network connections and what is not good network connections. So your firewalls might be not very helpful, specifically um, on a Windows network. Because on a Windows network, you use Active Directory, and Active Directory has a zoo of ports that one serve open, so roughly 10 or so minimal. And because it's Active Directory, and some of those parts have been defined in a time that is long, long, long time ago, and nobody thought about computer security, uh, the connections actually are initiated in both directions. So usually, you don't have something where you say, this is my VLAN, my admin sit in there. From there, I am allowed to have Active Directory's connections to all of the Windows system. That doesn't work because Active Directory doesn't allow you that. So you end up with a situation that you have a firewall network that segregates all of your companies into units um, and the ports that are usually open in both directions between all of the VLANs is the Active Directory network ports. So you de facto, from a standpoint of an attacker that writes malware, do not have a firewall. You just have a really big network. So, I quickly draw into another part. Uh, this, um, this, this is not necessarily connected. I will come up now with two points that are not usually, technically speaking, strictly connected to a parameter network, but that usually go hand in hand. So the first of one is, we came at some, at some point with user management, right? So uh, it is Windows 2000 times. Somebody says, hey, we have this Active Directory. We just need to create a user once, and he automatically exists on all of the machines. Isn't that nice? So when he quits, I only have to delete him, delete him once, and he's already gone from all those thing, systems. That usually happened palm somewhere between 2000 and 2003 um, for the first time in your company, and since that, it is in your company and has been insourced and outsourced and insourced and outsourced and seen several groups of administrators that all have different ideas about namespacing. Um, you have 20 years of legacy in your network, uh, lots of different naming schemes, and Windows or Microsoft does not give you good tools to the hand to actually judge for what is a group, what it's being used for, no really, and uh, um, seeing relationships. Because Windows groups have a nasty feature that's called nested groups. Do you know what that is? So a group can be a member of a group. Usually I'm doing this this way, that I need to have access to something, so I give a group access to this thing. And then I have another group that is member in this group, but in this group I'm putting all of the users. That's a very constru common construction. So you have your user base, you have the group where you put the users together in a group, that gives uh, uh, a rights to a different groups where you connect your rights to. So in Windows you have this right model that is then connected to the group and then decides over this. Very often you will end up in a situation um, of having a lot of groups. This now means you have low users in your uh, systems that are not only on your system but in the comp whole company network. And they usually have very elevated rights. Think the domain administrator over there. 
So that is not the administrator that works on one computer, that is the administrator that basically works on all of the computers. From an attacker standpoint, this is the user that you want to have, because then you're basically allowed to do everything in your company network. Another problem, also common in these types of network, also partially has to do with uh, uh, history. Um, when you have a large amount of computers, specifically you have 1,200 employees and want to give them laptops, you usually build what's called an image and you don't install a network or an, 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 an operating system on each of those computers. You build an image, you just put that on the computer, then you have a working computer and a very defined setup that is identical to everybody. Um, yeah, does it, it, who doesn't know what I'm talking about? Okay, I'm saving me the further explanation. So you have images, all of them are alike, all of them have the same vulnerabilities, and all of them have the same local admin password, because if you build it this way, every computer will have the same local admin password. So we have uh, therefore created the unholy tri uh, uh, trinity. This is really dependencies of most modern malwares that try to move laterally in a company network. They're looking for very alike software setups, ident ideally with identical computers over the whole network. Uh, let it be that they're directly centrally or that they're actually distributed like the local admin but have the same password everywhere. Um, and each system can reach each, each other. This means that if you have compromised one computer on a Windows setup, it's usually very easy to com compromise other computers. It has a positive side. It means when you're administrator, because all of your systems are alike, one of the main advantages is that debugging is relatively easy because you have a very well-known system. The same is true for the attacker. So he basically, whenever it needs to find vulnerabilities or all those things, this also means exploitation of systems. Uh, if needed, uh, it's becoming very... Uh, um, very alike and therefore uh, identical to exploit. And around 2015, ransomware started exploiting that. Um, first one of them was this one, Petya, um, that actually used those methods. Next one is the one that became way more publicity. I think some of you, for all those you have, maybe you remember this as a graphics in some media or online publication where you then saw want to cry because that really exploited large amounts of computers. And there was something where, which is the reason why I'm now calling myself a cyber warrior because it was sent by Russia. The idea was to affect the Ukrainian systems. One of the issues with it, it only moves parallel the RFC 1918 IP ranges. So only 172, uh, 31 and co. 192, 168, or 10 not something, it does not affect computers outside of this range. So it only works within your company network. Um, this very quickly turned into the largest threat for companies, specifically larger companies that are worked with Windows computers and had an Active Directory set up and the Parameter computer uh, Network. So in 2017, every single fucking company that has more than 100 uh, uh, employees Yes, this is an event where there might actually be people that work in companies that work in a different way. You're nerds. That's not the normal state. Well, I'm a nerd. I'm running this on Linux, but... And I'm the only Linux user in my company. <laughs> but this is uh, one of those problems. I'm uh, looking a bit at the clock. Complexity. Complexity got very high with the system that we built. We just saw we built a very complex parameter security, asking, can you draw it? No, if you can't. Your excuse for that likely will be it's too complex. The same is for your solutions. You have possibly self-built applications in your company network, um, trying to find out what uh, in detail they depend on. Uh, usually, uh, how do I call this in my company? Kills the sprint. And uh, complexity enables mistakes. So there's a way out. This talks, uh, and I, I saved you, by the way, roughly 40 slides from the other talks. So that was a very quick summary from over there. 
because we also want to get to a point that we actually want to have a solution over there. I uh, was in the situation that had this malware attack. Um, I worked after that in a finance company where, which was relatively small, where we tried to establish precisely a zero trust network. And after that, I got hired by the startup of the port of Rotterdam at that point to actually fix this. I understood it as fixed it as a startup, but then they sneakily, just be the day before I really physically joined the company, they merged the startup back in the port of Rotterdam and tong, I was stuck in the port. I uh, never planned to work in a, that large company, but suddenly there I was. So, uh, zero trust is an approach that gives the idea that I don't trust anything. I verify. I also implement last privilege and I assume breach. And all of those things mean something, um, but it's not the same for everyone what they mean. Never trust, always verify, one of the main mantras. This is one of the points that we're coming into here and what this will be about, this detail will be about in, uh, in general. You don't base trust on a network range. So who of you, those of you who have to deal with firewall possibly know how firewall rules are built. And they usually define an IP and then a, a port or a list of ports or a range of ports. And by that possibly some other parameters. And then you say you're actually, you shall pass or you shall not pass. Um, I'm not relying trust base anymore on IP ranges. I'm relaying now trust based on, uh, um, on cryptographically secured connections. Um, and I use this to verify the user and, by the way, the device um, before allowing them to access any data. So you treat, basically, it, it will not be the whole, it directly the whole company will not directly be on the internet because you will not have enough IP addresses for that. You treat your company network basically like the internet. Implement least privilege. Uh, implement least privilege is something that we say we do since a long time, and that is a user gets only the right that you want to, uh, you want them to have. The, in the praxis, that is very different. Um, so this is one of the points where you possibly have to pick up tasks already again of something where you used to know already how to do it. You just likely weren't doing it, and if you did, you save a lot of time here. So. Um, now, assume breach. That is another plan. You plan for breach of a system. You have an incident response plan. Now, that is something that you all used to have already before. You very often it's called then disaster recovery, which is actually a bit different thing from incident response, is when everything goes completely wrong. Um, but you have an incident response plan that usually is then by your compliance also at least passed from then accepted as the uh, um, disaster recovery plan. And you make the impact of an attack as small as possible. So to make that, you segment your networks a lot more and re 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 reduce, reduce dependencies. Sorry. I also had a joined the gala yesterday and speaking today is rather difficult. Um, by that I mean you're breaking your network in smaller areas than before. We in our company have a rather extensive public network range. So we call uh, connect these networks actually over our public IP range, which breaks the rules. Uh, the the, the uh, routes. So usually you have a 10 node something network, uh, you have your central router, you say in your local network that you have routes for some known ranges, but then you have in there something that's called a default route, and that points to your main router. And your main router knows all of the other routes. So from there your traffic can move on. If you actually leave the RFC 1918 IP space in between and go to the normal internet, you do not have a route anymore. Because you can reach the point that has the public IP, so to say, 
um, where you usually will have something like a proxy running where incoming traffic goes on that judges over certificates and uh, forwards the traffic based on usually application layer content. So what URL is called, if you have a WordPress and you somebody calls VP admin or so, then he goes to this area, but you usually don't define stuff in trust anymore in IP ranges. You define it on cryptographically uh, uh, certificates or client certificates. And you reduce your dependencies. Um, in large networks, you have the problem that everything relates to everybody, uh, you, to everything. That's at least the feeling that when you got when you for the first time try to draw a dependency graph in a company. Um, but it's usually not the uh, uh, one of the easier parts to actually reduce the dependencies in there. One of the core things will be stuff like logging, identity management, your Active Directory controllers for the group policies and stuff like this. Uh, you try to reduce them whenever it's possible. How? We'll get to later. And another part, application security, because you will in the future be connecting to applications, not to systems. Um, that also means that application security becomes critical. But to be really very clear, that's a talk of its own. And that's actually not one talk of its own. That's a bunch of talks of its own, so much that there is a lot of conferences actually going over this traffic. So I talked about verifying already over there. Um, it does include the encryption, because if it's, the connection is not encrypted, it doesn't make a lot of sense to authenticate to, to verify it at the end, because it might be modified and tempered with. Usually have an encrypted connection in between. And... Uh, um, Users and applications are mutually verified, is what's call, what is that called. If you look at an HTTPS connection, usually you only uh, verify the server you're connecting to. There is in the TLS, TCP IP connection, no verifying of where the user is coming from. That is in there, that's optional. You, you likely know this under the term of client certificates. That a client to connect, like you have your application, very likely you have an Nginx or in Traffic or something like that in front of that. Uh, on this endpoint is where you actually, besides the user verifying the certificate of the service you're trying to connect, um, to connect you also verify user client certificates. So, one of these points that you see that is the wrong uh, headline, I think I just cut a slide too much. Uh, um, you will see in a company specifically today, who of you works in a company that has moved to Office 365 or alike? Yeah, roughly half of you. They now work, so you will have a fair amount of users in your company that basically only works with what we would call cloud, cloud software. There's no reason why they need to be on the company network anymore. Um, usually by a way to make your work for your company easier, that's also the people that don't know how, don't have a lot of technical knowledge. That's why they don't have any administrative rights or any deeper rights in your kind of technical applications. Uh, it will also contain quite a lot of people from management. And that is, by the way, the easiest group of people to uh, remove from your company network. No, that's in a different slide that comes later. Because <laughs> indeed, you just identified one of the big problems, but I will go into the cycle, how you actually fix that. And your timesheets or your HR website, which very often also is just your classical SAP intranet solution that you have where you need to write your hours, which completely doesn't matter, and you get in trouble when there's anything different standing that are eight hours in there. So you just pre-fill the whole year in one go and change it whenever it's needed. Uh, but indeed, HR and your company administration, which usually also relies to a fair share in SAP to some degree, like I want a new laptop, I want this, I want that, I want to buy something, that is usually also then related to HR. But we're getting there. Ten minutes. Good. I uh, will get to. You need to have a backup, test your backup, don't base it on the same operating system that is Windows, um, and connect that to the Active Directory. But. We're here, I guess, mostly for this part. We want to micro-segment our network. So, uh, 
This is your parameter network, your castle that you're having over there. When uh, conquered, nearly everything is all open. Um, you have uh, you break with the micro segmentation your company network and some subnets. That is that the same as VLANs? No, because you're not making your decisions based on that on a network parameter, but on deeper going uh, usually application layer data parameters and user directly. So it looks like this: you suddenly have several company networks that in the beginning can't talk to each other. So there is no route to other networks or if you can't avoid that because you came too late to the party to actually get public IP space, um, then you actually do this via actually indeed VLANs and a firewall that says no. Um, unless verified, in this case, as discussed before, says this one. This, in this my, the one node, you have one network at point usually. That is where all the traffic that comes in goes in and ideally everything goes out. See this one node as, in our company, for example, it's products. Sometimes it's departments. Um, sometimes it's certain tools that you try to log in. To give you an example, you have an application, the Harbor Master works in there. Um, that's like 90 different services, microservices, how it's today called, in some Docker containers. There's some databases, there's some file shares in there. Um, if anyone needs to work in there, they are connecting the VPN now into this network. So you don't have your big company VPN anymore, but every of your sub uh, say, uh, segments gets their own network. Um, if it's in the cloud, think Bastion. Uh, if you're in Azure, uh, AWS, and so have other solutions, but if otherwise uh, uh, there is an open source, also a shit ton of possibilities to put a small network ideally as infrastructure as code defined, because that makes you a lot less work later into one node. Um, there is even sometimes VLANs within this network. So in the Habermaster software that we talked about before, um, they have like six different VLANs, databases and other resources that are being accessed. There is no admin connections into this network. Uh, whoever, when an administrator wants to do something, he has to use the bastion that is, or a virtual desktop that is also within this. So we are on Azure and on uh, still our own data center, so it's kind of a hybrid solution. We have microparameters that are on both sides, and very often you are in the situation that you have, for example, the VPN solution and some small stuff that you have around this, like also the virtual desktops, within this network then. So a person doesn't log, log in anymore to the company, he logs into his micro segment, and that means some people have to connect to multiple networks. Trust in there is based on uh, uh, cryptographically secured connections and not based on IP. That is the most important takeaway from that. Um, if those applications contain web applications, they have client certificates. I'm pretty sure you now go and uh, see where I'm going to. Uh, because HR and the SAP system will be the first one that are sitting in such a network. Um, you need identities. You need to be based on externally. You don't want to have an identity tree in every of those subnets. So uh, this is a CCAC event. Um, you would use Keycloak. We actually lose all, use also Keycloak in the company environment for certain areas. Um, if you're a Windows company, Entra ID, uh, so that was called before the Azure uh, Active Directory, is also not the most horrible solution. And I'm not a person that likes Microsoft. Um, but there's uh, also several other tools. Windows clients. You don't manage them with the Active Directory anymore. Um, you go this way over Intunes is a tool that's also from Microsoft that basically allows management over the cloud so people can be connected to not the network and uh, uh, still be managed properly. You also distribute your client certificates over this. You try to keep them outside of the company network and when they need to connect to the network you try to do this to web applications with client certificates. That will not always work. Um, but it actually uh, works for a large amount of people relatively quick. It's good. How do we get there? So usually what you do is identify a list of tools that are in the way of moving users outside of the parameter. I bet with 90% that HR and the code tools around this areas will be on the top of those lists. You take those and you move them out. 
and then you rinse and repeat. So now you have a small next round. HR has its own network. You identify the next tool. Usually we'll have to make three, four, five loops until you get to a point that you really kick out 80% of the users. And the ones that are left are usually relatively tech-savvy users. So from a security standpoint, again, I'm security, um, they are the smaller problems. It's not the ones that click f on the first phishing email coming the way. So getting to an end, you see uh, this talk was about change, like how not only our technology and our ways of working change, also dogma of the IT. Um, the uh, parameter security is a dogma out there. Um, and one of the things is I like uh, comparing parameter security to castles. I think it's a brilliant thing. Uh, there is no castles for defense anymore. All of them are museums today, or piles of rubble. Basically, you decide which of one your network will then become. Thank you very, very much. That was uh, basically the talk. Um, if you have any questions, I have two minutes left. Ah, good. Uh, if you have any questions, you have two more minutes. And after that, uh, you can also find me outside and actually talk over this. Um, and when it's not video recorded, I uh, uh, might answer a bit longer. Um, thanks for this excellent, for this great talk. Uh, my question is what, consider you have some legacy component because there was some software which is still in use and you can't... Micro segment. <laughs> yes, I know. I come now to my question. So I thought about it and I thought, okay, the, the, the point is how can I isolate with legacy systems, because, for example, we, uh, um, the crypto libraries on these legacy systems are legacy systems as well. So I can't actually encrypt my stuff in my micro segmented microservice because even the SSL library on it is so odd that it's basically. Oh, uh, well that's what you I mean with library stuff. At yes. all. Um, I uh, was in, a, in the company that I worked when there was a lot of legacy stuff that had good reasons why they couldn't install updates. Um, we made a deadline that was the 31st of December 2023. After this point, software that couldn't update anymore was no longer allowed on the company network. That sounds very crazy, but it actually helped. Nothing failed. Everything magically found a way of the software either being replaced or being able to be updated in some way then still. So that is something that, uh, uh, yes, you have legacy systems where dependency is a, uh, is a topic. In the worst case, it's what's nowadays called OT. So it's basically a computer with something attached, so a computer with a ship or a computer with a crane or something like that. Um, over there, you will basically also put them in one network and people that really need to v work on them VPN then basically into this system. So you build a virtual machine with Azure technology. Well, De facto in our company, we have virtual machines with Azure technology. Uh, we connect people with Bastion and they can then connect to the system. Uh, hi, thanks for the talk. That was really helpful. Uh, but can we go back to the, the slide with uh, multiple castles? Because I think that was a really good uh, illustration. No, uh, back with uh, multiple castles not connected to each other. Yep. So there is like even a lot of OSs like Fedora Silverblue and some other stuff that are based on this kind of idea, which I think is really cool. But is there what would be the best way to communicate between these castles? Uh, usually, user communication or client uh, automatic client to communication. In general, it works basically the same. I require external connections to be encrypted. That is in most companies also the same. And then you need a, a, a certificate. In the worst case, when your software really doesn't like you a lot, two engine X that kind of put another layer of TLS with client certificates around that help. Uh, we do this because the alternative sometimes is even more painful. Um, but basically, that is how I'm allowing connections between those castles. Um, you always have a network endpoint that is usually a traffic or an Nginx or something like that. There are several solutions for that. They then collect directly and have a client certificate which they, uh, for the connection. How do I manage those computers? Um, most of the stuff that is sitting in the data center is uh, infrastructure as code. 
So we are Git. So all of our server services um, only carry a Microsoft logo on the outside. Uh, below that is all Kubernetes, Docker. Um, I work in the software development area. We have around 200 software developers. So most of that is in this, this area. Um, they usually like servers are usually managed infrastructure as code. What? Uh, no, it's a pain in the ass to get there, but when it's there, it's actually relatively cheap and good. So it's like having it is nice. Building, building it's begin things from the beginning this way is even nicer. Moving the, uh, don't make just a shift left when you move to the cloud. That is the term that you possibly then heard. Like you just take everything, move it to cloud infrastructure, and drop it there. This is stupid, super expensive, and will not make you happy. Use the chance to actually to move when you move to the to some cloud setup. Move also to cloud technology. It's like having your services in just as a general in Docker managed by Kubernetes, and all of that built with a proper build pipeline. In, and all of that, it's a pain to get there, but when you're there, it's totally worth it. So proper software development. It doesn't work for everything. Uh, so <clears throat> uh, we are, I'm afraid we're out of time. I saw some additional questions. Maybe you can catch McFly later and ask, them, uh, ask him himself. Um, uh, yeah, well, I guess let's thank McFly for the talk again and uh, have a nice MMCD.